there's enough for a conviction. Um, you know, it's an interesting case, but there's no question there's enough for a conviction. Uh, you discussed the insurance proceeds. That piece is very troubling. If, you know, if I'm a juror, I'm having a hard time digesting that. Um, and not only the extraordinary amount of expenses that they that she was putting into the policies. Um, you know, sometimes these term policies, you get into them and you don't want to get out of them because you lose your place in line, so to speak, and have to start all over. But the testimony, if I understand it correctly, that really shortly after he died, she was contacting detectives for clearance for her insurance agent, if I understand the evidence correctly. Um, and I, that's very, to me, that's very troubling if I'm a juror. I mean, it's just, you know, let the man get in the ground before you start bugging the police for, um, you know, a doctor's note so that you can get your money. It just, that didn't sit very well with me at all. Uh, as far as the evidence, I'm at the Culinary Institute. You know, as long as we're talking about circumstantial evidence, in addition to um, the phone being inactive during that period of time, I haven't heard it talked about much, but I think as a juror, you can draw some infer inferences based on the evidence. And, you know, we're 7.30 in the morning and who else knew where he was at that point in time? You know, it just seems like it's a little bit of a leap to ask a juror to believe that there was this random murder. He's shot in the back at work at 7.30 in the morning. Again, it doesn't put the gun in her hands, but it just creates a little more um, question about whether there's reasonable doubt or not, or whether there is not reasonable doubt. I, I yeah, and, and an interesting